Hey folks, this is Jason Lewis, the producer of the From the Shadows podcast. I just want to remind you about our website, fromtheshadowspodcast.com. We have a Facebook page. We would appreciate it if you like and follow. Also, join our discussion group on Facebook called After the Shadows. We have a Twitter feed. Please follow us on Twitter. It can be found at podcast underscore from. Follow us on Instagram at From the Shadows Podcast. We have a YouTube channel. Go to the search bar of YouTube and put From the Shadows Podcast and please subscribe to that channel. We are also on the Odyssey Radio Network and we can be found there at odyssey1.com. We are still on the traditional podcatchers that everybody loves to listen to us on. We get a lot of feedback, so please rate the podcast and communicate with uh, whether you're on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, or Google Podcasts. We're there, and we appreciate it when you leave comments for us. We also have a Patreon page. It can be found at www patreon.com forward slash from the shadows you can receive books stickers coffee mugs and special content just for our patreon subscribers check it out for yourself and see what packages that we have to offer well that's all i have for you right now folks and thanks for being a part of the from the shadows podcast family so with that being said let's get this episode started Welcome, everyone, to the From the Shadows podcast. I am your host, Shane Grove, and with me, as always, is a super producer, Jason. Greetings, everyone. And Jason, we have a special treat tonight. The Barrister is back. What's up, Barrister? Hey, I'm happy to be back. Excited <laughs> about you... the uh, the guest tonight. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Are we, are we allowed to say the artist formerly known as... Or no, we got to okay. keep it the way it we is. We got to keep it the bears. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so we're super excited about our guest tonight. And, you know, he, he's super modest. So I'm going to do my best to try and embarrass him right now. But uh, for our money, um, he may be the most legendary guest we've had when it comes to Bigfoot research investigation and just helping kind of form the the commentary of of the subject since the patterson gimlin film you know i mean this goes way back so joining us tonight is i'm gonna say it the legendary bigfoot researcher daniel perez daniel how you doing i'm doing just fine talking to you from california is it uh, other than other than being able to enjoy the In and Out Burger? How's the weather out there? The weather, generally, the weather here in California is very nice, and today is another perfect day. I hate to say it. <laughs> you should listen. Rub I'm a mail. Uh, rub, yeah, rub it. In. I'm a mailman. It rained all day here today in Ohio, so don't don't be afraid to say it. Go ahead and, and rub it in our faces. <laughs> 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 so, so and Daniel, uh, and Daniel, uh, Daniel, uh, d- don't don't worry about him trying to embarrass you. He normally only embarrasses himself. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do such a good job of it that you know sometimes it kind of leaks yeah. out into into embarrassing other people. So you know that's what. <laughs> but so but without Daniel, further ado, yeah, yes. So Daniel, for our for our listeners all over the world. Inter- give give our listeners a little introduction on why you, we would even have you on the show. The people that don't know you, that aren't familiar with your work, you know, give them a, give them a little bit of history on who Daniel Perez is. Very good. Uh, born and raised in California, Southern California, age fifty seven. Uh, union licensed electrician since nineteen eighty five, and I've been bigfooting since about age ten. My interest developed by that legendary movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek. And when I saw it with my big brother and big sister uh, at a walk-in theater, 
I thought it was just another monster movie because that, at the time, I guess, you know, Godzilla was on the screen and King Kong and movies like that, just thrillers. And I thought my impression going into it, because I knew nothing about it, only there was a monster on the, the flyer that uh, in the newspapers then, let's go see this monster movie. And then they were presenting The Legend of Boggy Creek as if it were a documentary and factual. And it really hit me like a ton of bricks. And I I had trouble comprehending and believing what they were trying to put across. And at the time, I already had a library card. So I trotted down to the Norwalk Library there in Southern California and uh, got a hold of a few books. And uh, that's how I got started. And I never thought it was going to go beyond that, just reading a few books and, you know, just uh, a young person's interest that fades away. And what happened is I got a hold of a couple of books with addresses in them because there was no internet at the time. One was by John Green. The other was by Rene de Hinden. So basically, uh, I wrote letters to them and they responded. And so that even... If you could say, like, if you were a drug addict, you just, they were putting at your disposal more drugs. And so <laughs> that even, that even sucked me in even more. And, uh, they, they assured me that this was a serious subject and, uh, a serious mystery and that, that there was, uh, something to it. And so I got all revved up and I started, you know, collecting the newspaper clippings, uh, because, Back then, there was a lot of newspapers uh, and books on the subjects, uh, and uh, so that's how I got going. And uh, it, it, it's interesting because you could think of it, say basketball, and you're an, an apprentice basketball player, and you're being taught right out of the gate from by Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I that's a great analogy a, right there. Yeah, it was just a, a stroke of luck that I, I, I hit right onto Rene de Hinden and John Green, who already were pretty legendary in the field, who would become more legendary. And I plugged right into them. And so that kind of, uh, I, I look back and realize how fortunate I was to, be associated with them because they were very factual. They were very grounded. Uh, there was no woo in their Bigfoot research and investigation. And so it was, uh, it was a good, I was a good protege of them. And so that's, that's how I got started. And right around 1979, I, got this idea in my head because we had a, I guess my parents bought one of those uh, selectric typewriters that you plug into the wall. And so I said, well, maybe I should start publishing a newsletter on the subject and, you know, trying to get information together and send it out. And so that's when I started the first edition of the Bigfoot Times, and that's with one T. The Bigfoot Times still lives today, but it's a it's a it's a newer edition, Bigfoot Times, two words. And for those readers who are or listeners who are listening, uh it's BigfootTimes.net is the website for the newsletter. And so I publish a newsletter that goes out monthly and have been doing so. And it, it you know don't know where the time goes, but it's been some twenty three years. So that's my principal publication in 1994, actually 1992 would have been the eve of the Patterson Gimlin film, the 25th anniversary. So in 1994, which was a couple of years late, I published the 25th anniversary edition of the Patterson Gimlin film and what we knew about it in a booklet called Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. In 2003, I updated that book, and what Rene de Hinden said at a conference one time in the late 1990s about it, 
uh, he says, uh, it's the best damn thing ever published on the film, Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. And so that was one of the greatest compliments I ever received about that publication. And uh, so you know, the interesting thing, the interesting thing, Daniel, is that the subject matter, guys like Cliff and Bobo and Matt Moneymaker and, and some of these other guys that we see on TV, they're standing on your shoulders and, and Renee's and these other people's shoulders and presenting the subject matter Bigfoot through an entirely different medium than you would have been able to do back when you were a kid. I mean, you sit down an electric typewriter and created the Bigfoot Times and, and they create Finding Bigfoot or, you know, Exhibition, ex, exhibition, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Expedition, <laughs> Bigfoot. And, and so, and what's interesting about that is, Daniel, and, and I'm going to confess this, I really didn't, I'd never heard of you because I've been sucked into this TV um, theater on the subject matter and, and, and have not went back and went old school and read the old school books. And and, and I think a question I, I, I want to ask you is because I haven't read those books. The, the, the early research that you did and these other giants of the subject matter did, you describe as real scientific. Uh, compare that to what is going on now. And, and I'm not saying that well, it's, 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 it's farcity or anything like that, but it's just a different approach to the subject matter. It, absolutely. And – I think Tom Steinberg had pointed it out to me, the Canadian Bigfoot investigator, is that with the rise of the Internet and social media, is that Bigfoot research has turned into like a social outing and more, you know, you're more popular if you have more likes, and so that makes you a better researcher, at least in the eyes of many people. And mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of television... Uh, yeah, that's a great way to get massive exposure, but uh, a lot of it's entertainment. It's it's more entertainment than uh, a serious documentary on the matter. In fact, I could probably count on my two hands the number of serious documentaries that have ever been presented on the subject matter. There are few and far between. Take nothing away against Expedition Bigfoot and Finding Bigfoot, but I see a lot of entertainment in it. It's just, it's trying to attract eyeballs. It's commercial TV, and so that's the whole essence of it. And and then by the time you sit down and contemplate what it is you just watch, you know you realize that this is really a super serious scientific question: whether Bigfoot as a species exists in North America. And yet it's presented as entertainment. Right. I agree. Right. Hey, uh, Daniel, um, do you feel that uh, having these, I don't know, with the social media and uh, just having shows like Finding Bigfoot, do you feel that this here, since uh, they, they like uh, sort of uh, sensationalize Bigfoot to get ratings? And do you think that takes away from the actual concrete research or does it actually enhance it and just get more people involved in it? It, it does both. It, uh, it does both. There's, there's more people involved in Bigfooting in some facet or in another here in North America than ever before. Okay. Had someone told me in two, that in 2021 there would be so many Bigfoot researchers, quotes around that, here in the United States and Canada, uh, tens of thousands of them, I never would have believed it 10 years ago, but the, here we are. And in the, in the sense that the television aspects of, of the programming uh, take Finding Bigfoot and Expedition Bigfoot and um, those just happen to come to mind mm -hmm. is that the people at the university level, physical anthropologists and biologists and whatnot, they steer clear of the whole thing because they have this impression that it's all tabloid and that there's nothing to it. And, it, you know, uh, you see on the programs, we're going to come back from break and there's this scream or, uh, impression in the dirt and uh, you know they really don't 
it, it doesn't suck them in. It pushes them away. And the scientific community is what we want to attract. And instead of doing that, we're repelling them. Mm, yeah. Now, now, Daniel, so I, I mean, I, of course, we host a podcast and we talk about this subject, but I also, you know, I'm a big fan of like Sasquatch Chronicles. Okay. And right. I, so I can remember growing up in the seventies and me and the barrister, you know, our big introduction into the cryptids and the unknown were like, you know, every, you know, we've said before every Friday, you know, you get that scholastic uh, weekly reader book order form and we'd get every Bigfoot book and every Bermuda Triangle book and, you know, anything to do with ghosts, you know, and we would devour it. But that was all the exposure we had to it unless in search of was on and just happened to talk about Bigfoot. Okay. We did in Ohio, yeah. we didn't have anything. You didn't even think there was anything like Bigfoot in Ohio, but you are out in, you know, you grew up somewhere where it's, you know, generally thought this is where Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest in California came from, or the, you know, or it's, or it's the most populated with Bigfoot and the most, uh, eyewitness accounts and stuff. So what I'm kind of getting at is, is so in the early days, you know, and I've, I, I, like I said, I heard your interview and how you would go out and follow up on people's sightings or if they found footprints and stuff like that. Do you, do you think with like Sasquatch Chronicles and even like the stuff on, on television that makes people not quite ready you know they don't label somebody a nut job if they come want to come forward and say they saw bigfoot like how what's the difference in uh sighting reported sightings that you're getting now versus you know 30 40 years ago like are people more open to to talking about it because of podcasts and television and social media talking about it well, some people are. The only thing that I have trouble with with a lot of the websites or Facebook groups is that they'll have a discussion about a certain sighting, yet they will not identify the eyewitness and say it's a crime scene. It has nothing to do with Bigfoot. And someone witnessed a fatal auto accident, and they contested it because the witness, they felt the witness, they you know, it's the witnesses, Joe Q Monday or whatever his name is. And they'll say, oh, he was a very good witness. And he's the only person to, to say that the guy ran the red light. And then you investigate Joe Q Monday and you find out he's the town drunk. So that and that maybe his judgment and his observation skills are not as good as they should be. And so that's why. You always want to know about the witness because you want to check out, check about check the background of the witness to see is this person a competent observer. And so when you when you take away the name of the eyewitness and just say it, it was an anonymous person, that tells you nothing. And so I've always been been big on saying like we want to find out the name of the person because we want to find out something about that individual in terms of an eyewitness. And as much as I'm not a big fan of David Polites, if you look at David Polites' first two books on Bigfoot, he does put the names of the eyewitnesses in there, and I thought that was a very commendable job to do so. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, think, I, I think the big concern, I mean, I, I think one of the concerns for me is that Sasquatch as a whole is a very serious subject matter and people have figured out there's a, this is a great subject matter to monetize mm -hmm. and yeah. that anytime you, anytime you have a, a chance to monetize a subject matter, you have to question the credibility of people's motives when, when they're doing things and saying things. Is this something that someone is trying to generate an income stream from a alleged sighting or, or a witness or an event and things like that. So I, I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, because I could be totally wrong on this. 
you know, you were, you know, you were in the trenches of the subject matter back when you were a kid. And, and, yeah. and, and, and so when you talk to somebody back in the seventies, um, was there a stigma to coming out and openly saying, look, I know you're not going to believe this. You might think I'm crazy, but this is what I saw because I know when I was a kid and, and I had a, 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 a cryptid experience that we've talked about on here numerous times, I was too embarrassed, scared, and very reluctant to tell anybody about it for fear of being made fun of and ridiculed and things like that. But it seems like almost like today, and we encourage people on our podcast to do it, oh, yeah, to come yeah. forward and, and give and give stories. Does that lend itself to more fabrication and inauthenticity? I guess is is, is where we're at. It's, uh, I and guess, that's the part of the, about the series of the word we're about. I would say that's a double-edged sword in the in the sense that when you put your name out there, yes, people will or there's always that possibility of ridicule because the vast majority of people have never seen something like this. But then again, you look at the vast majority of people that live in the city who go out on a weekend trip to use <clears throat> Yosemite or the woods, they never see a mountain lion out there in the woods because they're rare and they're nocturnal. But that doesn't mean mountain lion aren't out there. And so, uh, right. so in that sense, you know, and that's why there's a lot of people who will tell you something, but they say, don't use my name because what people will ridicule them. So they don't want that ridicule. And so sometimes I guess as an investigator and a researcher, you have to, I guess, sympathize with that and understand it. But if you're the principal investigator and say Matt Moneymaker from the BFRO uh, there's many reports, in fact, probably the vast majority of the BFR reports are anonymous, but someone, their their investigative team had access to the person and knows the name, and they vetted it, and they said, well, I spoke with this individual on the phone, he came across as credible, and it's just like, I mean, I could be talking to Charles Manson on the phone had he been living right now, and you know, he could tell me something and I could say, well, wow, he sounds very truthful and honest to me. That doesn't mean he is. Right. So that's, that's why, That's why. you know, you have to be careful with people who claim, uh, you know, who had 10 sightings and they never had a Kodak moment. And it's just like it could be anybody. It's just like they said, yeah, I've seen Bigfoot 10 times. And, you know, the first question is, well, where was your camera? And it's just like, well, 10 times the camera failed. They didn't have the camera on them. They didn't have batteries in the camera or whatever the case may be. And so, so Daniel, all, all, all I'm saying is that there's a great many factors in assessing eyewitnesses and, and you know, some people might be, uh, say, for instance, a lawyer in a certain city who has a very high standing reputation and say him and his wife go out in the woods and they have a sighting of one crossing the road. And I can understand the lawyer saying, I don't want my name used, but here is what I saw. And But as long as the principal investigator knows that this is an attorney that spent a great amount of time in school getting schooled for what he does, and has a high reputation with his clients, and he doesn't want to sully that reputation by saying, like, I saw a Bigfoot cross the road, which most people don't believe. And so they said, I would just rather be anonymous. And I can sure. understand that. And so as long as that comes sure. across in the report. Yep. So, so Daniel, I, if we can shift gears just a little bit, I, and sure. I know you, you – you you think from a, using a scientific mind, and, and I just you know I wouldn't mind picking your brain on on this subject matter because I just don't see it enough. I, I you know I enjoy, I enjoy I enjoy watching Bigfoot shows. I enjoy listening to Bigfoot podcasts, but I just don't think people spend enough time looking at it from a scientific basis. And you know f from the way I look at things is that look what if Sasquatch is real 
what is it? Where does it fall? You know, where where does it fall in 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 the in the species categories? You know, is the um, you know we well, we have a, a go ahead. It's funny that you should bring this up because when I spoke at Don Keating's meetings in Ohio in the mid 1990s, a newspaper reporter from I guess the Columbus Dispatcher, one of those newspapers, approached me, and I think he said, "Well, what are we dealing with? Is it an ape or a man?" And I told, I I backed up and I said, uh, I said, you know, for all practical purposes and for technical purposes, forget about that distinction right now. Just call it a primate because that covers all bases. And it's just like, and that's they quoted me, and that's in the newspaper, and so that's on record. And I, I'm happy to have said it because people say, well, it's an ape or it's a man or whatever, and it's just like at this point, until you actually have one. The answer is we don't know, and so well, I, I think if, if I'm correct on this, Daniel, and help me out, you know, humans and apes are so close, so close in DNA that, that there are people out there that, that argue that humans and great apes, uh, you know, gorillas, bonos, chimpanzees, orangutans, we should all be classified under one species, and, and I know they classify humans as Homo. You know, Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, Homo whatever, well, and that, and I think apes are under Pan, or right. I can't remember what the other one is. Right, but 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 the thing is to differentiate with you, you physically look at the apes, uh, gorillas, and it's just like there's no question they are not us, and there's no question we are not them, and it's just like. Uh, just because you see a dog or a cat run down the road and they, they're both four-legged, that doesn't mean they're the same species. That just means that they happen to walk on four legs. And so mm -hmm. that's why, even though we share, I guess, the bonobos or something, they said it's 99.6% our DNA. It's mm -hmm. that 0.4% that di makes the difference. And it's just like, I mean, you don't have to be highly schooled to take a look at a bonobo or a chimpanzee or an orangutan or a gorilla to say, like, that is not us. It's just, you know, they're a But you know, species. Daniel, something inter interesting about the bonobos is they have the same blood types as human beings. They have A, A, B, you know, O. I mean, in, in theory, in theory, you could do a blood transfusion from a bonobo to a human. Now there's some there's some complications there you wouldn't really want to do it, but but they actually have the same blood type as we do, which I found pretty fascinating um, when we start talking about what is Sasquatch. You know what I'm right. saying? Well, like it, from if, an intelligence if, if, standpoint. If you want me to guess, and which I would gladly offer you, is like if anyone were to ask in terms of the primate primates that are alive on the planet, who is the closest relative to man, I would say it would be Bigfoot. But then you'd have to say, like, <clears throat> Bigfoot really exists. And I absolutely right. guarantee 100% they're out there that Bigfoot would be our closest relative. Well, sure. so, so, Daniel, so I want to get back to all the money that you've made in doing your Bigfoot research, you know, because... Or, you know, or wait a minute, all the, money, <laughs> uh, all the money I've lost doing Bigfoot research. <laughs> and I think, I've, uh, I've gone yeah. far and wide uh, <laughs> on my own dime doing I this. And, and, it's like, and I, so, think, yeah. I think that's what really... I mean, that's what gives you... The legendary status in my book is that this is a true passion. This is something that you love, and you're not doing it for fame and fortune. And well, maybe some of that might be nice, but you know, when I hear about you going out and you know following up on somebody's sighting, it's not like they're paying you to go do that. You're going and doing it for the sake of the subject matter and and research and finding out what is really going on. So how well, let let me tell you one report that I followed up and this is Silver Star Mountain, Washington State, and I'm in Southern California. 
And this was, uh, I believe it happened November 2005, if I'm not mistaken. Randy Chase is the eyewitness who took some photographs that were first published in the BFRO database. And it just happened to be that Cliff Barackman was still living in Southern California and paid a visit to my house. And so we were having a rousing discussion in my office. And so that subject came up and I just happened to put it out there. And he happened to say, oh, that's Randy Chase. And then my eyes lit up and I said, oh, you know the eyewitness because in the BFRO database, it just listed anonymous witness. And I, I said, uh, oh, I'd love to love to be in contact with him. And so I got his phone number. I did a telephone interview with him. And then uh, a couple of years went by, and it was like April, May 2009, and they had the Yakima Bigfoot Roundup in Yakima, Washington for Bob Gimlin. So I went up there, and unbeknownst to everyone, I arranged a meeting with Randy Chase. I said, would it be possible to get you as the eyewitness to go up to Silver Star Mountain with me to show me exactly what happened and to take the camera that you had? So right after that meet, I took off to, I guess it was the Seattle area where he lives. I hooked up with Randy Chase, and we went hiking up to where he had his sighting and he told me everything. And there, there again, this was all my own resources to do that investigation. And it's interesting because he had photographs to accompany what he saw. And I went over everything and an extremely credible eyewitness. And uh, everything I saw was was very, very good. And they said, well, it was probably people on Bigfoot forums and various websites and even on Facebook, even today, they said, oh, what he photographed there was just a guy in a hoodie in the snow. And so when I, we did some recreation footage of Randy Chase himself at the same distance, it was very clear, even at that distance, you could pick out the clothing because I could see Randy out as my test subject standing where that thing was, the subject. And it was like, Oh yeah, that's that's an article of clothing. So had it been a guy in the snow and a hooding ho- with a hoodie jacket, that it would it would have been very easy to distinguish. Yet people don't want to hear hear what's found out in experimentation. They only want to hear what what they're offering based on not going to the site, just based on being a keyboard warrior on the internet. Bingo. That's and that's for and that's what I'm saying is that's you didn't get paid to go do that. You did that because you could connect the dots and actually go and confirm and like basically put your stamp on a on an eyewitness story and say Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And for the love of the subject, you know, for for the love of wanting to to get to the bottom of what is going on. So, I mean, so we know that you go out and investigate well, other people, you know, other people's stories. Do you go out bigfooting yourself at all, or is that not something that yeah. you? Well, over the years, because I'm 57 now, so let's just say half my life is over already. And early oh no, come on, now don't be a downer. Because we're, I mean, come early on. on Early on, I did go out just to various locations, but now I'm more like a fireman in the sense that I stay put until there's a fire, then I go out. And it's the same thing. It's just like, why just go, you know, hoping for random luck looking in the woods when it would probably be more advantageous to go out when there is a a recent sighting and you could follow up immediately. And uh, Cliff Barackman has put himself in an excellent position in the sense where he lives now. He used to live in Southern California. He lives in Oregon now. And so he's more, you know, 10, 15 minutes. He's in the woods. And uh, so he's in an excellent spot. And I I think that's just fabulous. Um, Who's a better investigator, you or Cliff? 
Come on. Let's 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 just put it out there. Who's better? You or well, Cliff? Probably probably Cliff because he's done he's he's had a lot more you know, all that finding Bigfoot, it's just like you you know, and going to various locations, different locations and using this electronic equipment courtesy of finding Bigfoot. It's just like, yeah, you you develop some skills. You develop some skills and you know he he goes out. In fact, I was just talking to him less than a week ago, and he goes out, following up on things. And so he's he's. Uh, I admit it. There's there's a ton of people out there, including Cliff, who are out there a lot more than me. You know, I'm the nine to five guy who does it when I can do it. So, Cliff is a full well, you know, the thing is though, with, with all the advancement in technology from when you were a kid it really hasn't produced any more evidence than what you saw well, as a kid. That That is a very, very good point. But that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's just like everyone seems to think that, or let's just put it this way, that the game cameras that everyone has, they think they're, they could set one up on a tree and they're going to have uh, a la Patterson-Gimlin uh, frame 352 on their game camera. But that is yet to happen, and there's probably a ton of Bigfooters who have done this, put game cameras up in strategic locations. And so one thing that, in fact, Cliff sent me an article, it was about, oh, I guess it was, uh, I forget the name, Wolver, not Wolverine, uh, Bobcats or Wolves or something that in certain areas where uh, biologists had set up cameras to track their their whereabouts, that it the article in essence said that there was an, an intentional avoidance of game cameras by this pack of wolves or whatever. So if wolves or whatever the species may be uh, are intentionally trying to avoid these cameras, then I would think that something like a Bigfoot might be doing the same thing. And I, would, I would I would think so since, I mean, I think it's apparent that they're way more intelligent than um, a pack of wolves or, you know, whatever regular animal walking around the woods, you know. Well, I mean, so, so Daniel, let me ask you this. And I get this all the time because, because there are certain people, friends, family of mine, who mm-hmm. just say, you guys are wasting your time. This is made up. <laughs> this is a colossal. This not is our colossal friend, not our friends and family. What are you talking yeah. about? Uh, and, and the thing is that they're out there. I went to law school with Matt Moneymaker. Uh, if, and so, you know, a guy like that says, hey, look, you know, I'm going to spend all this time and I'm going to I'm going to do all these expeditions. But I despite everything Matt Moneymaker has done and Cliff and Bobo and, and all these people, Nobody has produced anything like Bob Gimlin did. So and Roger Patterson. Um, yeah. And yeah. So 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 what do you say to those people? Because I, I try to argue from a scientific standpoint because I don't want to get. Uh, I think that if you try to get into a supernatural alien component with a lot of people, they just they just don't take you the least bit serious. I I would say do not be discouraged because. Let's just say, let's just use an analogy as the lotto. Most people do not win, but we know for a fact that, say, when the lotto gets up to almost a billion dollars, that sooner or later someone is going to win. And so we know for a fact that someone wins, but it's only one individual. It's not a ton of people. So it's not like it can't happen for someone. It just hasn't happened and the odds against it are tilted in the opposite direction. So people who are spending a lot of time putting up game cameras, I would say keep doing it. Don't don't stop. Don't quit. Right. Don't be discouraged because they're out there. And, and what, what would you say to someone who – I'm sorry, Dave. What would you say to someone who said, listen, yeah, if Sasquatch is a primate, okay, then, then – there are no primates in North America. Um, you know, there's no there's no fossil record of primates in North America. 
And and how would and how would primates deal with the extreme colds in in, in North America? How do, how do they deal with that? So from a science well, standpoint, we, how do you? We deal had with that? an article. We had an article in the Bigfoot Times, and this was several years ago, and I think it dealt with a a primate that is now extinct. I'm I'm trying to jog my memory, but somehow you could almost think of it that it had antifreeze in the blood, and that's how it was able to hold up in extreme frigid temperatures. And it's just like you and I might not think about that too much, but it's just like when you're born and raised in the woods and you've your the whole lineage of your species has been thousands of years living in the frigid temperatures that somehow nature provides for you if you want to survive. Mm-hmm. And so they you know, you have reports in frigid temperatures and tracks and whatnot sightings and it's just like in Ohio, for instance, in cold weather, and it's just like uh, below freezing, and it's just like how that is possible, I don't know, but this is what the eyewitnesses are reporting. And I would say if we were to able to dissect the big, but we'll say like, oh, look at the stuff that they have in their blood. No wonder they're not freezing. Well, I do know that, or, that, that mountain gorillas, mountain gorillas in, in Africa, like in the Congo and Rwanda, you, you start getting those mountain gorillas. They they can they will traverse up to twelve to fourteen thousand feet altitude, where the temperature up there is basically a uh, uh, you know subalpine, you know it's below freezing, and they somehow with the length of the fur in their coats they subsist in you know sub zero weather. Well, when you get to twelve thousand feet, um, you know how how cold it is, and you now they come down. I mean they'll go up, they'll come down, but they somehow survive in sub-zero temperatures and and i think this well okay well you know if, if if mountain gorillas can do that if they can come and they can go can you know certainly a sasquatch could you know with with the right amount of fur and different things like that i, I would think would be able to pull it off yeah i i don't see any problem with that and it's just like i mean john green when he was uh building databases and publishing his books, I mean, it only takes one or two passes to realize that that they seem to be holding up very well in extremely low temperatures. And now that John Green is gone, Matt Moneymaker with the BFRO database, all you have to do is start digging in there to realize that, hey, there are reports in some extremely frigid temperatures that uh, it doesn't seem like they would be there, but there they are. And it's just like well, one the, or the two thing th- that people, you know, the, the big thing of the, the doubting Thomases and the things out there that say, well, you know, if, if something's really 10 feet tall and weighs 800 to 1,000 pounds, how many calories a day does that thing have to consume to to subsist? Pro- and and probably- is there in the winters, in the winters when, you know, when when food is scarce, how do these things survive? Well, the the best answer is we don't know. For me as an investigator and a researcher, I would be happy to tell you I don't know because most of the questions, as I pointed out in the newsletter, the Bigfoot Times, it's just like uh, we have to understand we are investigating and researching Bigfoot reports. We're not investigating and researching Bigfoot. There's a difference. You see what mm. I'm saying? Mm. We're investigating yeah. Yeah, I do. reports. <clears throat> we're, we're not looking directly at the animal and finding out what's going on. So that's the difference. And it's just like, so, so the best answer for most of the questions that have anything to do with Bigfoot would be, I don't know, or speculation. I think this is what's going on. But really, we don't know because and, you know, Daniel. Anyone... I appreciate that answer. I, I really appreciate that answer because because that's an honest answer. And and, and yeah. I'm not naming names or anything like that. But but I've asked you know different people, and, and they want to expound upon things that as if it's factual. Well, you know, they eat elk and they eat deer, and they, like, well, there's no real factual evidence that that is true. 
why do you right. presume? You know what I mean? So I, I think that there's a lot of people out there that that want to presume facts. It, it, as a trial lawyer, there's an objection call where you would object to something that's called um, uh, assuming facts, not in evidence. And right. uh, and that's kind of the same way that that that, that people just um, they just assume that certain things are true, even though there's no actual hard evidence that those things are true. So I really appreciate yeah. your candor with the uh, you know we just don't know. Well, yeah, and the the the, the trouble is most of the big footers in North America will give you some sort of answer when. The, the reality of it is that they don't know. They're just trying to be uh, t to show their assurance and their aptitude in an interview by saying they do know. But in reality, they don't know because if any big footer worth their salt in North America knew anything, you'd be able to get an appointment with a big foot. But nobody can get you an appointment. <laughs> Bigfoot. Uh, we can barely get an appointment with a doctor. Little, how can we get an appointment with a Bigfoot? I mean, seriously. Yeah, so you see, you see what I'm saying is that the yeah. best answer to most questions that have to do with Bigfoot is that we don't know because I know I don't know, and I've spent an enormous amount of time on the subject matter. And, in fact, I have the largest physical files on Bigfoot in the world. Wow. wow. Well, now, so, da so Daniel, then – so why are why are you a believer? What was it that made you know without a shadow of a doubt that these things well, exist? Well, there's multi multiple things. I've interviewed tons of people throughout the United States and Canada. And in Ohio, uh, there was a very impressive individual. I think his sighting happened in 1980. The individual's name is Patrick Poling, and I just found out he's still living and they made a casting of what he saw. There was a footprint. So that's one individual that myself, uh, I interviewed him personally, and I've interviewed tons of people in California. So interviewing people has satisfied me, but I've also seen physical evidence. Uh, in 1979, in Hemet, California, between San Diego and California, I saw tracks in the ground. Uh, Doug Trapp was with me. He's still involved in the subject to some extent. And so we followed up on some reports because there was activity happening in Hemet. So we said, well, let's go out and take a look. And so it was just happenstance that we stumbled upon these tracks because we didn't even know where we were going. We just said, let's just go out and look at this area. And we just got lucky. 1986. August of 86, uh, CNN, a much younger company at the time, they had phoned me and they asked me, are you going to go check out this report up in the Menachee Meadows, which is the, the Sequoia area of California? And it just happened to be that we had a little break at work, so I had a couple of days off. And so I drove up to meet the witnesses who were building a footbridge over the, the Kern River in the Monachi Meadows uh, in the Sequoia area of California. Uh, you could kind of, kind of uh, for, for a podcast interview, you kind of think of it like somewhat near Yosemite. And so I went up to investigate, and so I'm doing a taped interview with the eyewitnesses. I think there were five of them. And the guy tells me, yeah, and it left tracks right over there. So I, I quickly shut down the tape recorder, and I said, tracks. And I said, can, can we see them right now? And so we went to look, and the tracks were, I think, 13 and 5 eighths inch long, 5 eighths inch long. And they were in sandy soil, so they weren't really a good, clean tracks, but there they were. So there again... I'm seeing something in the ground that is convincing me of the reality of the subject matter. And those eyewitnesses, they were all grown men, and they told me that this thing came into the camp area and that it was it screamed so loud, as they put it, this is almost a direct quote, they said it was like a stadium loudspeaker three feet in front of you. And so they said, they said because of that, 
And because they could see the thing, I guess in silhouette, that they knew it was real. They knew that this could not be fake. And they made a decision to leave their camp and to go get out of the area, which they did. And they came back, I guess, a couple of days later when they got a little more, got their uh, ambition up to get out there again. I, that would be pretty, you know, you hear a, you hear a sighting like that where, like, you're right there and it's interacting with you. I mean, screaming at them is interacting with them. Uh, to, to even get up the gumption to go back out there uh, at, to the scene of the crime, so to speak. I mean, I that's yeah. my, my hat's off to him. And and then for you guys to go out and say, hey, we want to see if we can, you know, we can find it. Because it seems so foreign to us growing up here in Ohio, like I said, because we didn't think it was here. We thought this was something that was just out there uh, in the in on the Pacific coast, you know. So. Well. I want to add to that that uh, in the early years of my Bigfooting, there was an author called Marion T. Place, and she wrote a book. I think it was called uh, On the Track of Bigfoot. I may be mistaken. That was her first book, I think. And then another book that she wrote was, I think, called Bigfoot All Across America. And so when I, I think that came out in 1978. So when I got a hold of that book, uh, I go, my goodness, there were reports in Oklahoma, Kentucky, Florida, Ohio, and it really kind of, it kind of expanded my brain in the sense that, wow. And I said, well, what she was talking about, more so Marion Place than John Green at the time, uh, in her book, was that these things are all over, and it, it kind of made sense to me. I'm saying, well, wait, I, I started thinking about it. Again, you have this thought process, and I'm thinking, I'm saying, well, wait, there's deer all over North America. Why couldn't Bigfoot be all over, or all over North America? And so it made sense to me. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. I get, because, so, so I mean, Daniel, just, can I ask you this? Since, sure. since you since you're willing to, at this point, classify Sasquatch as more likely than not a primate, fair to say? Yes. Okay. I I, I just find it troubling because I'm not going to do this. That I'm going to wander around in the woods looking for a large primate because if I was in Africa and I was searching for gorillas <laughs> or chimpanzees. They would rip you apart. I mean, these are not. I mean, primates aren't, aren't really docile creatures that that are ben, you know are benevolent and you know you know th th they're dangerous animals. I mean, do you ever feel that this is a dangerous thing for you to be participating in? Yes and no, and it's just like all I could say is anyone who's going out in the woods looking for Bigfoot or just going out in the woods in general. I mean, the real woods, I'm not talking about Yosemite or something like that, uh, that it's always probably a good idea to have a knife on you and probably a good idea to have firearms on you. And the reason I say that is because there could be any animal out there, even a deer uh, or an elk or a mountain lion, they could jump you. And it's just like, you, you're not going to pick up and call 911 and say, like, you know, there's a mountain lion 20 feet in front of me. It's just like you have to protect yourself. Absolutely. So you do want to have, yeah, you want to have some sort of protection. But by and large, Bigfoot, when they see people turn tail and go the other way. So it's not like... A, like, you know, if you see a Bigfoot that you're going to get ripped to smithereens, that's generally not the case. Uh, you could look at one classic case, 1924, Fred Beck, uh, Mount St. Uh, Ape Canyon, uh, is that they, if the story is true, they provoked them, and it, it sure looks like now, from the research that Mark Marcel has done, if I'm saying his name correctly, uh, 
is that they provoked one by killing one, and the group mm-hmm. that was with them said, like, we are going to exact revenge, and we know exactly where they are. They're staying in this cabin, and they came and bombarded that cabin with rocks. So in that instance, and if you look at it, it's just like, they were provoked. They were provoked. They didn't. They didn't decide to uh, bombard that cabin with rocks just to do it as something to no. do. <clears throat> they had one of their their one of their group members killed, shot, went over the ravine, and they said, "You know, we're going to get back at these guys," and that's exactly what they did. So it, it seems like, in general. You know, if you're you're going to be poking and provoking a Sasquatch, there's probably consequences involved. You know, that goes with the, just about anything. You know, if you're if you're yeah. out in their yeah. territory, you know, no matter what it is, well, if you're out messing around, so, and so you're does that like provoking something? So, Dean, so Dean, does that harken back to to like a lot of these Native American tribes who who in their oral history? tell stories about, hey, look, there's certain areas of the woods you don't go into because this is where, when they have different, obviously different names besides Sasquatch, um, th- this is their territory. You do- if you run into one, you don't look it in the eye, you back away from it, and things like that. Is that yeah, more and, what, you, what you're saying? Is it? There, there are probably areas where Sasquatch Bigfoot is very comfortable living because everything is there for them in terms of mate, forest coverage, uh, water accessibility, and food. And so once they get in that area, they consider it theirs, their territory. And so once you encroach, you know, that might not be a good thing. And it's just like, yeah, so maybe Native American legends have you know, sayings or or things that they pass on to the youngsters that, you know, you don't want to go into certain areas, and that that might be so. Now, Daniel, before, you know, we've kept you a long time. I mean, and we, I think we could keep you for hours. Oh, we could keep you for a long hours, <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I, but I, I, wanna, I wanted I, to... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I wanted to talk to uh, talk to you about Ohio. So my first time in Ohio was in 1996, and Don Keating and, and at the time uh, Mark DeWorth was getting involved with him a little bit in terms of getting his interests developed. And so I was with Don Keating, and he introduced me to quite a few eyewitnesses, and I interviewed these people. And uh, all I could say, I was very impressed. And it's just like it. it I always told the people in Ohio, it's just like, of all the places that I thought Bigfoot would not be, I thought it would be in Ohio. I mean, what's there for Bigfoot? And it's just like you start to realize that Ohio is really prime Bigfoot country. It's just like there's, there's I think the latest census, there's over a million deer in Ohio itself. And so that's a, an abundance of food sources for them. Well, speaking on behalf of the drivers in Ohio, I think we'd like some more Bigfoot <laughs> to take care of the deer population because the deer are ridiculous. So if any Bigfoot well, you know, is the... listening and wants to come and feast on deer, we have them here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the other thing, you know, the other thing, Daniel, is I think people in the Pacific Northwest get a false understanding of what Ohio really is like. We have lots right. of, of woods, um, and, yeah, and, and you could when, traverse, if you wanted to, you could traverse from Lake Erie all the way to the Ohio River and not be seen because you could follow river banks and woods, and you could do that and never be seen. I, I totally agree. Prior to me going to Ohio in 1996, the first time I have ever went to Ohio, I didn't really think that Ohio was a state that really had Bigfoot. I was, I guess I was skeptical, even though I read about reports in Ohio. And so once I get there and start talking to Don Keating and start looking at the lay of the land, it quickly became obvious that 
the idea of Bigfoot in Ohio. It's just like it's a no brainer. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's some really uh, how do they say it? Squatchy places in Ohio for sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But well, I, I mean, to even mind, we have cornfields. We have just an abundance of cornfields that that act as as foliage. I mean, if you you can you could traverse from one woods to another and, and, and go through a cornfield and no one would see you. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, de deers do it all the time. Now, now, Daniel, there is one. So I, so I mean, we firmly established that, you know, it seems like you're really in the camp that this is a flesh and blood. This is a, you know, some sort of man, you, you know, human primate, whatever out there. What, what, what do you make of the supernatural aspect that is coming into some of these Bigfoot sightings and stories and, and oh, stuff? And, yeah, because right now we're getting 50-50. You know, Dean, yeah. we're getting 50-50 on guests uh, who are what I would consider prominent Bigfoot research people. We got 50-50 think it's a biological creature, and you've got another 50% that want to put some uh, an alien – supernatural multi-dimensional being you know check on this thing so yeah, what's your here th here's here's the thing about the supernatural and the paranormal it's hard to put a tape measure on that but something that is physically real you can you can do some testing with it and it's just like as john green and i had a conversation years ago that that uh, the th it was probably in the 70s when the three-toed tracks started to show up. But also at that time, there was these magazines, pulp magazines called UFO Report and stuff. And it was basically, prior to the Internet, an invitation for writers to publish dramatical things that would attract a readership. And so that's when they started having the psychic connection to Bigfoot or UFOs and Bigfoot are connected and three-toed tracks and Bigfoot. And so it all ended up in these UFO publications. And so when they kind of went away, the, it, the, the paranormal aspects got tamped down for a little bit. And then lo and behold, the internet gets up and going, social media. And so all of this is alive and well again. And so isn't that interesting? Mm. I'm not saying that that uh, disregard all the paranormal, but I'm thinking that maybe if there's anything paranormal there, that maybe that's a, a, a separate, has nothing to do with Bigfoot whatsoever, but something entirely different. So I'm, so I'm you're, saying you're, like, what you're basically saying is it, it, it's almost a National Enquirer spin on the subject matter. I was thinking more I, like I, a I, weekly I, world news. Like a weekly yeah, world news. I mean, <laughs> you know, when when people say like, well, Bigfoot came out of a vortex or whatever, and it did this and this and this, and it's just like, well, that's the pers that's the eyewitness stating what it did, and it's just like that's hard to test. I mean, we have enough trouble just believing an eyewitness who just said he saw a Bigfoot cross the road, and it's just like, and you go there, and there's no Bigfoot there on the side of the road. And that's that happens all the time. And so to think that, you know, Bigfoot is jumping out of a UFO or a flying saucer, it's just like it doubly strains the imagination. And it's just like all I can say if if that's your cup of tea, more power to you, keep doing it. I'm I'm not knocking it, but it's just like I'm I'm interested in the biologically real Bigfoot, not the paranormal Bigfoot. Right, what Daniel, what Daniel's is, yeah, because Daniel, what you're saying is you, you have to take multiple leaps of faith. One, you have to believe that there's Bigfoot. Two, you have to believe that there's aliens. And three, you have to believe that there's some, that you have to believe in the supernatural paranormal versus your side of the argument is, look, you just have to believe in biology. You just have to look at right. and say, look, there are apes. There was a creature called Giant Pithecus that lived 10,000 years ago in southern China that resembles a lot of what we're seeing today. That's not a huge yeah. stretch. It's not a giant leap. I mean, with, with what you've just said, you could connect the dots. 
and then and then you right. all, then the further if you go a little bit further, you would have to assume because very so few people see them that they're rare. But then I'll stop you right there. There's probably a great amount of hunters in the United States and Canada who have been out hunting deer or whatever the case may be, and they've probably never seen a mountain lion, they've never seen a wolverine, but they know for a fact they're out there. The reason you don't see them is because their populations are extremely low. And the reason why you probably don't mm-hmm. see a whole lot of big, everyone doesn't see a Bigfoot is because the population is extremely low. You take any city person outside of Ohio, say go back to New York City or uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco, and you ask them, have you ever seen a deer in the woods? And it's just like you're probably going to get about 100% of people raising their hands because deers are so uh, highly populated. There, there's great numbers of them. So the more numbers, the easy it is to see them. But ask them, have you ever seen a wolverine? They probably don't even know what one looks like. Right. The, popular first, the, well, the, the other thing is, Daniel, you start looking at like mountain gorillas. There's less than a, there's like a thousand mountain gorillas in the entire world. That's it. Right. And, and there's a con, you know, there's a conservation component to trying to bump those numbers up. We don't really know how many Bigfoots there are in, in, in North America. We don't know what the gestational period is for something that big. Well, I mean, we know that elephants right. are what, like gestational is like 27 months for an elephant. The bigger the animal, the longer the gestational period, at least for the mammals. So we, we don't have any idea what the real population is. And when you try to say, well, you know, how many people have seen them? How many of them really exist? Do they travel well, in, do they, do they travel in, in pods? Are they, are, do they, or do they mate for life? Do they, I mean, there's just so many things we just don't have a clue about well, that I'm, I'm thirsting for knowledge then. When I interviewed John Green for Fate Magazine when it was in existence, and this was about 1995 or 1996, I asked him, what would you estimate the population of Bigfoot would be in North America? And he said, he said for the amount of reports at that time being reported, there would have to be tens of thousands of them, if not somewhat close to 100,000. And you think about that, 100,000 of anything in North America is not a big number. No. It's, it really isn't. You Two, spread them yeah. out all out. A couple thousand and, a state, and, and, you know. And and, 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 and you, you you talk with people like the, the late Dr. John Bindernagel, the field biologist, and Dr. Jeff Meldrum, the anatomist, and they would say, based on other animals, that the populations would be maybe maximum five thousand. So there's a big there's a big variation. Wow, that's a big, in, yeah. in the answer. And then you got to realize that the, the 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 education that Meldrum and Bindernagel had was vastly different than what John Green had. John Green was educated as a journalist. And Meldrum and Bindernagel in the biological sciences. So they're basing their right. answer based on other animals, and Green is basing his answer based on what's being reported. So somewhere in there, the answer lies. But even let's just put it this way: if a, if a Bigfoot were found tomorrow, even ten years down the road, we would still have trouble wondering. What is the exact population of Bigfoot in North America? Because no one would have an answer on it because they're so damn hard to find. Yeah, well, exactly. Like, like it, black bear. Like, like you look at black bear. I, I was shocked one time. The, the, the first day, the very first day of black bear season in western Pennsylvania, the hunters took over 600 black bears. I, I couldn't believe that there's that many black bears in Western Pennsylvania, let alone they were able to kill 600 of them. And, and how many yeah. times have you ever seen a black bear? Very yeah. rarely. Mm. Well, Daniel, um, the, this has been a great, this has been, this, this interview has been better than we had even anticipated. Just well, it was engaging, and, and the main thing, you have a, listen, a listening audience out there, and you want to stimulate and engage them, and 
that's what I try to do. I mean, when you talk to me, you're just going to get me. Yep. And so yeah. that's what I presented. And so in my newsletter, the Bigfoot Times, and I hope people rush out and get a copy, but uh, uh, that's what I do in the newsletter. I talk about things that uh, people only think about. Well, I can attest because I, you know, I heard I, I heard your interview with uh, Cliff and Bobo, and I'm like, I got to check out this Bigfoot Times, and I quickly became a subscriber, and I appreciate how quickly you got out the January, February, and March issues to me. So I was able to, uh, to read those. And I mean, just some great, some great stuff in there. Then I think, I don't know how many of these you have left, but I got the Patterson Gimlin film site, like fold out. Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. Yeah. yeah the Bigfoot big, at yeah, Bluff Creek. It, it is so cool to, it, it, it has pictures from the, shortly after the sighting of the Patterson Gimlin film. And then every four to five to 10 years of what that uh, area looks like. And it's amazing oh, you're to talking, see how that's changed. You're talking about the fold out postcard. Yes. Yes. The, yes. Yes. The fold out postcard. Yeah. 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 The, now, are, do you have any of the Bigfoot at Bluff Creek books? Are those still available? There, for there, there, there's about, Bigfoot at Bluff Creek, there's about 20 copies left, and I'll probably end up taking them to Ohio when I talk at uh, the Ohio Bigfoot Conference on May 1st. So between talking with you and that meet, people are going to inquire about it. So, yeah, they'll probably be sold out by then. We'll see. Well, Grant, I'll have, well, we have I a got, very, now I got a very – I got to order. Uh, yeah, own. we got an audience that I think will order all of them. We've got yes. uh, we got some diehard fans that may want to uh, to buy all those up before you ever get to Ohio. <laughs> well, well the, 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 the thing about it to have a sensible discussion about the topic is that I don't think it's really necessary to jump on the paranormal because. I mean, you look at bears, elephants, gorillas, walruses, killer whales. No one's really dumping them into the paranormal aspects and for the very fact that we know they're factual animals. And once you, once we establish that Bigfoot is a factual animal, all the paranormal stuff is probably going to drop by the wayside. Really? That's... Well, that was the same way with the, with the giant squid. I mean, I mean, keep in mind when... You know, sailors who sailed the Atlantic Ocean and stuff like coming to America, they they told stories of giant squids and people. They were fantasy and 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 stuff like that. And then lo and behold, you know, 20th century rolls around, and guess what? We actually find the carcass of a giant squid. And so all those stories from you, you know, folklore and mythology, and you know, these are creatures, mystical creatures. No, they weren't. They were just real biological creatures. We just didn't have a body yet. Yeah, and so that's, I think, you know, it's right now anyone can entertain ideas that stretch the bounds of reality, and that's okay until we get one, and if we get one, then it might change everything. Do you um, do you think that's going to happen in our lifetime? And I'm putting this all together I, because we're not, I, we're not much younger than you, way. so I'm putting this all together. <laughs> let's just put it this way. I don't know because... Uh, when I interviewed Rene de Hinden for Info, the Info Journal, which is now defunct, which was published in the East Coast, and that was about 1990, what, 31 years ago, uh, he said that when they were on the Pacific Northwest Expedition in the 50s in Northern California, they thought that a Sasquatch is going to jump out of a tree or jump from the backside of a tree and boom, they're going to get one and it's going to be all over. And so when he passed away uh, in 2001, he still did not accomplish what he set out to do. The same with John Green. Both of the, both of those individuals went to their graves without realizing uh, uh, Bigfoot is a factual animal. Wow. No, so to answer, to answer again, I don't know. I just, I just hope that we could get the the mystery resolved. But it's, it's everyone is realizing it's a lot harder than we think. So, in the 
the interest of getting a body or getting a Bigfoot, are you hitting one if it runs across in front of you? Are you going to purposely try to hit it? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just like I would love to have that opportunity, but it's just <laughs> like, you know, I play. Would you I think, play, yeah, I mean, like every like everyone else, I play the lotto, but I've never won. So it's just like <laughs> I really don't even think of that. Think about that, because it likely will never happen. But you know, who knows? Well, I, I, I hope that uh, I for somebody who's been so dedicated and put so much time and effort into this subject, I hope that uh, that you do get the chance along with the rest of us to, to find the answer to this question for sure. Uh, I, I would just love to have a sighting and that hasn't happened yet, but uh, I would be satisfied in this lifetime. If I just had a sighting, I never have, but I would love to see one. Well, when you come to Ohio, do you, do you know, have you ever met Amy Boo? From uh, Ohio? I've only, I've only spoken to her by phone. Um, I tell you what, when you come to Ohio, you're gonna get get with Amy Boo. I'll bet she could take you to some pretty squashy places in Ohio. I mean, I'm one for one with Amy Boo. So all I can say is that, uh, you know, maybe she's good luck. Well, I look I look forward to the opportunity. <laughs> so tell everybody. So tell everybody where they can go and become subscribers to the Bigfoot Times and find your other stuff, and then when you're going to be here in Ohio. I'll be there uh, April 29th. Uh, I think my plane flies in April 29th. Uh, The Bigfoot Times, just go to bigfoottimes.net, and you could get a membership going, uh, and you could get the fold-out postcard from the Patterson-Gimlin film. So that's the website, and it's a plain vanilla website, no bells and whistles. Hey, that's that's the way it should be because it's just nothing but the facts, man. Nothing but the facts, yeah. you know. And yeah. and where can where can people get the Bigfoot of Bluff Creek? Well, I'll have some available because I think we printed four thousand in two thousand three on the second reprint, and now. I didn't do a physical count, but just looking at the stack, there's probably about 20 left. So probably going to be available there in Ohio, and that's probably going to be the last of them. Oh, boy. All right. So listen, listen, everybody, if you want to get that book, especially with the high praise that came, it's the best book on the subject. Mm. Um, I strongly suggest you get to the uh, the conference there and – get one straight from the man himself. So, and I encourage everybody go check out the Bigfoot times. I was so happy to get those. I mean, if, if something would have been like around like that, when I was a kid, Oh my God, I'd have been in heaven. Oh, Oh, we'd have gobbled it up. Oh my God. The Bigfoot times is the last of the physical mailed out publications on Bigfoot in the world. There's no other publication that's mailed out to a membership, a newsletter on the subject in the entire world. So it's a one of a kind. Wow. I love it. That, that is and impressive. you know the thing about it that is, is you know the thing that the thing that I love about it is 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 I I really love the ability to put my hands on paper and yeah. uh and, and, and read something versus digitally read it. I, I'm, I'm yes. old school that way, mm-hmm. and I and I miss it, that. Me too, Barrister. It, I feel the same way. It, it's it's different, and it's just like there's a ton of people out there who like to physically hold the publication that they're reading rather than just looking at a screen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, nothing. Hey, there's nothing like. Uh, eating my cereal in the morning and reading some Bigfoot times. I'm seeing serious. There you go. <laughs> it's fantastic. So we, Hey, we appreciate not only you, you know, everything you've done in your, uh, career, you know, for, for those of us, uh, mere mortals when it comes to Bigfoot, but I mean that you're still doing it, you know, I mean, and I, and I yeah. can't, I can't, I can't not, 
think of Daniel Perez and think legendary because in this, in this subject matter, I think you truly are um, a legend. I appreciate Well, there's the certain, you know, there's only a certain amount of people that have traveled to the Holy land to where the Patterson Gimlin footage was taken and you've been there. So Anytime. that's kind of like that, you know, that that's that, that spot that, that people aspire, you know, a bucket list thing. If in, people who follow the subject. I'd love to go see that someday. And you've been there many times. So I yeah, would love so, to have yeah. that experience. So, well, thank you, Daniel, for uh, spending uh, some time with us. And uh, we, we really are looking forward to our, our listeners to, to getting a chance to, to listen to you and then go check out your stuff. And hopefully everybody here in Ohio will come out and say hi to you for sure. So, well, very good. I look forward, I look forward to being back in Ohio. I think the last time I was there was 2004 when I spoke at Don Keating's meeting. So now I have the opportunity to speak at Mark the Worst meeting at the Ohio Bigfoot conference. And boy, I'm looking forward to it. Yes. And I think as they say, as we yeah. say in Ohio, O-H. There you Daniel go. Does, and it's Daniel does, I-O. Wait, is it, Daniel doesn't get that. He's, he's I know, that's why you were supposed to chime in the <laughs> I-O. <laughs> well, I was pausing just to see if he maybe was really hip to that. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't get <laughs> <laughs> Well, Daniel, safe travels, and, and hopefully um, maybe uh, we'll, we'll be able to make it to the conference and actually say hi to you in person, so. That would be wonderful. It's yes. just, it just, uh, it's just, I love the subject matter. I love meeting people that uh, are into the subject and, uh, there you have it. All right. Yep. Well, thank thanks. you for coming right. on, Daniel. I appreciate thanks, it Daniel. so much. Thank you so much. Well, very good. All right. I, Bye everyone. I appreciate yep. you having me. Yep. yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the From the Shadows podcast. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are out. <laughs>